In the history of mankind, we have tried a myriad of different ways to see the future, or to see things that aren't quite clear to the naked eye. Crystal balls, palm reading, tea leaves. My uncle was quite drawn to dowsing, where you use two sticks to try to find water underground. Yeah, I never quite got how it worked. But this is also true in our electronic designs as well. We are always trying to find a way to beat the future, to make sure our project has the legs to last another decade or two. And with the lifespans of our embedded designs today, we need to look farther and farther ahead into the future. Shoot, where is that crystal ball of mine anyway? Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. How in the world can we future-proof our designs? Heck, I don't even know where I'm going to have lunch tomorrow, let alone what kind of code density my next design will need, or how hard it will be to migrate my MCU, or even what kind of development tools I'm going to need next year or next decade. My guest today is Brendan Slade from NXP, and we're digging into these very issues in today's Chalk Talk. And we've got quite a bit of ground to cover, my friends, so let's get started. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find more information about how you can future-proof your next design with an 8-bit alternative MCU. Hey, Brendan, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Amelia, it's great to see you again. Looking forward to our chat today. Okay, so we've talked about 32-bit MCUs quite a bit on Chalk Talk in the past, but this time we're talking about future-proofing. Now, Brendan, how the heck are we going to do that? Yeah, it's a really good question, right? I kind of like to have the analogy of looking at the road ahead and you've got your old dependable car, you know exactly how it works, it's simple, you know how to fix stuff with a hammer when it breaks. Right. But then you're looking at, well, if I've really got to consider that long road ahead, is it going to get me where I need to go? And if I look at a new vehicle, what's that going to mean? Plus, I've got to deal with car dealerships, which is never fun, right? Never fun. <laughs> right. So there's so many things about that new car, but I figure everyone has a worry list. Absolutely. So I'm guessing we're headed to the future. What is that stuff we need to worry about? Well, I think People who know 8 and 16-bit micros, and I've been there myself long in the distant past, the obvious thing that comes up is code size, right? So the instruction set is nice and small and compact on these 8 and 16-bit MCU. So how is a 32-bit going to blow up my code base and therefore my cost? Right. Then what is it going to cost, right? If I look at my system level cost when I put in a 32-bit micro, is that going to blow up too? Sure. Can I sustain that in my end product? And then after I do migrate, if I take the leap, so how future-proof is it really going to be? Right. What other things in those devices could really help me out? if anything. And do I have a roadmap of processes to really take me a long way into the future? Because you don't want to keep migrating, right? Right. And then how hard is that migration going to actually be? So looking around the broad field of all the 32-bit micros out there, what development tools do I get? And what other things can help me, like drivers and software? Okay, so we all know that 8-bit and 16-bit MCUs have smaller instruction sets, but how can 32-bit measure up in code size? Yeah, because it doesn't seem logical, right? You think right. of 32 bits, you think 32 bit instructions. Well, when we talk about 32 bit micros here, we're talking about ARM Cortex M0s and M0 Plus devices. And guess what? Every instruction except the branch instructions, the branch long instructions are 16 bit. So you're already oh. in the same kind of ballpark. Cool. And one other thing to think about is when you get above 64K bytes of address space, then you have to start putting in all the extra overhead to manage that in 8 and 16 bit micros. And that's where the code size starts to grow. And it doesn't just grow linearly on the same rate as before, it actually grows on a steeper curve. So your program size blows up more quickly. Okay, so in the MCU game, there is always a concern about energy and performance. What's the story here with 32-bit? So, yeah, people look at the gains of a 32-bit micro and performance. They expect to see a gain, but how much is that likely to be? And what does it really mean to the system? 
Yeah. So if you look at an independent benchmark, like a call mark, you can see the performance you get by running at a lower clock speed and therefore at a lower current consumption really kicks in with 32-bit micros. And you get at least 2x the call mark performance per milliamp versus the closest 8 or 16-bit competitor. So that's a real boost in your energy savings and that has knock-on system cost savings as well. And also there's more headroom and the Cortex-M0 Plus can sleep most of the time and give you that option of either saving energy or having headroom for the future. Very cool. All right, so that's about what the ARM core can do. Is there anything else that LPC can do to help me with energy efficiency? I'm really glad you asked me that because the answer is yes. Yeah, we put a lot of things around our Cortex-M0 Plus implementations in order to give the developer lots of knobs and switches to turn to save and optimize their power. That really comes down to on top of our silicon technologies giving you an efficient implementation and great power performance, but also at the programmer level to being able to control what's turned off, what's active at any point in time. Right. And the flash memory is one of the bigger consumers of power on any device like this, so that you can just switch off the clocks to that, shut it down. And that saves a lot of power. And obviously, I didn't mention the core, but you can stop the core as waiting for data and so on. And then you can go through turning off different parts of the system until you get all the way to a very almost dormant state where the current consumption is extremely low. So this is when you set the whole system up, you put it in your box, ship it to the customer, it sits on the shelf for years. Yeah. But the battery is still okay because right. the current consumption is just so low. Cool. Okay. Now, 32-bit MCUs are being used in a lot of different designs these days and a lot of different markets. And a lot of times they are part of a bigger system. So cost can be a big deal. Right, Brendan? Yeah, exactly. And it's easy to get kind of caught up in the MCU because it's quite often going to be one of the more pricey things on your bomb. Sure. But you've got to look at what is my system cost going to be? And these pennies here and there can really add up. Absolutely. So take, for example, say E squared prom. And if you want to store some system parameters or track some data over time, then E squared prom is what you use because as small pages, you write small items of data. One of the unexpected benefits of the LPC 802 and LPC 804 is they actually have a type of flash which is much more like E squared prom. Mm. And so its page size is very small. And that means you can get rid of that E squared prom and just use the flash that's inside the device, which is a nice unexpected bonus. Yeah. But then there's other things all around the system. Quite often a general purpose MCU like this is being used to aggregate sensor data. And that could be analog. It could be running at different voltage levels. So that that could mean an external ADC or DAC or a a level shifter. And all of those things can be sucked up by the LPC 802 and 804. So that's a nice cost saver. And one of those devices that kind of surprises people how much they cost is an IO expander, which Mm. is a I squared C device. You talk to it over I squared C and it gives you a bunch more GPIO. And you can use these devices for that function, but also you can kind of do an I squared C expander on steroids, if you think of it that <laughs> way, right? Yeah. So you have some big, powerful application processor based on a Cortex A class device, example like an IMX8 or something. But that device won't have E squared prom and ADCs and things like that. But what you can do is hang one of these little guys off of it over I squared C, and it can do all those functions for you very, nice. very cost efficiently. Very cool. Okay. So Let's dig into that programmable logic aspect. I'm really interested in that part. Yeah, we kind of geek out about that one too. Especially, you know, <laughs> that when the architects came up with that, they were excited about that. Then we had the delay while we'd get the chip out. And now right. the FAEs are geeking out about it too. <laughs> nice. And I geek out about the tools, which is kind of one of the nice things about it. So what is it for? So you have this block of programmable logic, which is completely autonomous to the micro inside the Cortex M0 Plus. And when you set up the registers to configure it, then it just runs and it's built on these lookup tables. So it's very simple to use and understand. So the obvious things you might use with this to say, hey, I've got 7400 series glue logic on my board. I can suck that in there. But one other cool thing you can do with this is you can actually combine it with some of the peripherals on the device itself, like the spy bus or the UART, and do really cool things and solve those weird and wonderful quirky protocols like serial RGB LEDs, which yeah. everybody knows and loves, right? You see sure. all these big strings of multicolored LEDs. Well, it's a simple interface, but it's a bit quirky and it doesn't work like a standard MCU interface. But by pairing up the spy bus with the PLU, you can solve that with extremely low overhead on the MCU, close to zero. And other MCUs out there can 
control these RGB LEDs, but they're doing it by tricky timing and bit banging, which takes right. a lot of resource from this kind of thing. Yeah. So that's exciting. And they can do other stuff like drive motors and stepper motors and solve some other kind of strange protocol problems as well. Okay, Brendan. So how hard is it to use this PLU? Again, I'm glad you asked me that one because it's not hard at all. So it depends on what your background is as to your preferred design technique. The PLU is built around lookup tables. So you can go in there and you can set up these lookup tables directly, or you can mix that with lookup tables and rule primitive logic gates and even use logic equations. So you can do that. So that's nice, right? Yeah. If you're more like, ah, I know about gates, I just want to do a schematic capture. You can do that. And then the tool will synthesize that into the register settings for you. So you don't need to do any of that. It's all completely abstracted for you. And then if you're really up to date, you can use Verilog and you can actually code in Verilog. And again, it will synthesize it cool. for you. And if you can see from the screenshot, there's a little bit of code there. You just copy and paste that code into your application. It sets up the registers and boom, away you go. Nice. That does seem easy. Okay. So Brendan, let's get into the software side of things. Do you have some options for me here? Yes. Yeah. So again, it takes all kinds to make a world, right? It sure and does. People who like their registers, people <laughs> like to get down in registers and respect to those people because the amount of information they hold in their heads is quite amazing. It is. <laughs> kind of scary. But for people who like that, Code bundles are the answer. Code bundles are written in C, but they go down and they show you what's happening at the register level. Mm. So you can get a lot of comfort if that's what floats your boat about knowing exactly what your hardware is doing. For those of you who like to not know what the hardware is doing so much and yeah. just want to say, hey, I want to send a character over my UART port or I want to send some I squared C data, etc. MCU Expresso SDK is the right answer for you. And the other advantage of MCU Expresso SDK is because it's available on multiple other other LPC and Kinetis devices, you can also port that code more easily to those devices too. So what's the cost here for this? Is this spendy? It's not spendy. The only spendy you have to do is to go and register one time on NXP's website, and then you can download the code. It's all under BSD licenses, so you can basically use it in your product without any concerns. And it's also provided with projects for IAR, Kyle, and MCU Expresso IDEs, so you don't need to invest time on that as well. Cool. Okay. So what is this MCU Expresso? Is that a new coffee spot in the area or something? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Yeah. Uh, the MCU Expresso coffee bar. I like that. <laughs> Yeah, so it's actually our brand name that we use across our Kinetis and LPC microcontrollers and actually expanding in IMXRT as well now. So that name is used to cover our free IDE, which is based on Eclipse and a GNU compiler. The SDK, which is a collection of runtime software that we were just talking about. So your drivers, middleware, RTOS is where applicable demos and examples of using those things. And then finally, the configuration tools or config tools for short. These provide you with a suite of tools for system and pin configuration. Cool. Okay. So how does this all fit together? Walk me through the flow a little bit. Right. Yeah. So I said about registering. So once you've registered, you can just go to mcuexpresso.nxp.com and then it gives you a nice pictorial view of boards. You can pick the board you're using. This is one of our standard development boards and build your SDK. So there's different options to include and exclude in the package. That pops out a little zip file from your browser. You download the IDE and then you just drag and drop that zip file in and then you're ready to start coding. There's demos and examples and we have videos of how you do this. And then you go to Mouser, you order your board and then you build your example and then it just runs down on the board. Simple as that, a couple of mouse clicks. And our boards typically provide an onboard debug probe or you can buy one from Sega or PE and use that. So you develop your code, you get all familiar, you start doing your own application and then your board design guy shows up, puts the board on your desk and says, here we go, get that going. Nice. That's right. So using the pin and clock configuration tools, you can then adjust where everything's hooked up and get running on your own hardware. So we're trying to get you not only through the typical I can run Blinky on the standard dev board, but right through to running a real application on your own board. Nice. Let's talk about pin configuration. Multiple configurations can be mapped to a whole bunch of different pins, which can be difficult to say the least. Tell me about what you got from here. Yeah, the challenge is, right, no matter how good our manuals are, and they are, of course, very good. 
Um, (laughs) It's hard because you have to go and reference all the information. So you're trying to look at the page talking about the I.O. configuration and look at the package. So the intent of the pin configuration tools is to give you a nice visual representation. So in this screenshot, you can get a gist of that where we've got some pins you can see set up in the PLU column. So we're saying, oh, these pins here are highlighted on the left are hooked up for PLU. We can see a picture of our chip as well just to help us visualize it and maybe line it up against the board or a schematic. And then on the right, there's the code that's generated, which is giving you convenient, consistent naming for your pin functions and also setting up some basic electrical parameters for those as well. Cool. Okay, so let's talk about clock configuration. Yes, clocks. They can drive us all crazy, right? Indeed. So the devices we're talking about today are fairly straightforward with clocking, but still having a nice pictorial representation is really handy, right? Yeah. So you can really kind of see what's going on. And with the clock configuration tool, you can use this visual representation. You can also look at tabular forms and so on, and then they'll generate a set of clock setup instructions for you. And these are going to get that whole clock structure set up. So it's then just a function call to get that done. And I didn't mention, but on both this and the pin configuration tool, you can either use them standalone or inside the MCU Expresso IDE. And if you use them inside the IDE, then you can just press a button and the code that's generated just drops into a standard place in your projects. So it's push button. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's circle back to this roadmap. How does this all lay out? What does the migration path look like? Right. So I think people are going to be looking for that level of comfort that I don't design on this one really cool chip and then there's nothing else, right? right? And I'm tied to that forever and it doesn't give me the headroom. So at NXP, we've been focusing a lot of attention on the 800 series over the last few years. It was introduced back before 2016 and then we've since then added more parts, particularly, as I said, just recently. And we will continue to be expanding this product range because the devices are being very popular, very successful. So we're pretty excited about that. But even beyond the 800 series, there's the 51U68 device, which we launched this year. And that takes you all the way up to 100 megahertz performance and lots more memory. Still nice. very power efficient. Yeah, it's a very nice device and somewhat unique. And then if you really want to step up above M0 pluses into the more powerful M4 class devices, then using MCU Expresso SDK, that's a much smoother path. And you can see we have plenty of devices up at that level of performance as well. So lots of safety around. And of course, longevity programs I didn't mention, but NXP parts are pretty much comprehensively covered with longevity programs that run to at least 10 years. Wow. So so there's lots of road ahead. Excellent. Now, Brendan, no one wants to be on the bleeding edge when their lifeblood depends on it, right? Have these actually been used anywhere yet? Yeah, they have. So the original 800 series devices shipped in hundreds of millions of units. The other ones are obviously newer, so they're not at that level yet, but they're being very rapidly adopted and designed in and product shipments started last year for all these newer devices. And here's just some the kind of applications that we're seeing them in, but they general purpose so they pop up all over the place from gaming to wearables to home appliances remote controls etc 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 cool okay so what if i want some more information where should i go so yeah nxp.com has got all the information about the lpc product line also connect is imxrt as well and we have information about our boards or software and so on and mauser also is obviously a very close partner of ours they supply all our development boards you can easily see what stock there is available from mauser even from the nxp site and so you you should have no problem finding the information. Of course, if you do, you can go to our community.nxp.com, post a question, and we have a team who's dedicated to supporting that community. So we're there to help you. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Brendan. Thanks, Amelia. It's been a lot of fun. I look forward to the next time. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find out how you can future-proof your next design with an 8-bit alternative MCU. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal or check out YouTube, keyword EE Journal.